I'm Jeff Groh, and this is Partial Differential Equations. So what is a partial differential equation? We must have an unknown function of more than one variable. For purposes of illustration, on list two, it could have more. And it must be an equation involving partial derivatives of this unknown function. So we can express those as follows. The equation may involve the independent variables. It may involve u. It may involve the partial derivative with u, of u with respect to x, partial derivative of u with respect to y, and higher order derivatives as well. The list must be finite, however. We're not going to allow this list to go on to infinity, involving an infinite number of derivatives, just a finite number. So for example, let's suppose I have the differential equation du dy equals zero. Here I'm assuming that u is a function of x and y. When I write an equation like this, I'm showing the variables, the independent variables that u depends upon. I'm just saying u is a function of the independent variables x and y, nothing more. To solve this equation, you can see that u must be constant relative to y, but that doesn't mean that u is constant, period. It just means constant relative to y, but perhaps not relative to x. So the solution is u is any function of x, an arbitrary function of x. If I have any function of x, its partial derivative with respect to y will be zero, and hence anything in this category will be a solution. As you can see, we'll have perhaps an infinite number of functions that solve a given partial differential equation. A partial differential equation that might be of interest is du dt plus c times du dx equals zero. By the way, this symbol, which is often written in this form and perhaps better written in this form, is a stylized letter D. In old days, if you wanted to write the letter the word land, you would often curl that last D way over like this. Very common in old style writing. Now, in this case, I want to recall something about directional derivatives. Understanding directional derivatives will tell us what the solutions to this differential equation are. Remember that if you have the directional derivative of some function f in the direction of the vector u, the way in which you calculated these directional derivatives was to calculate the gradient of f and dot with the vector u. So you would have the partial derivatives of f dotted with the coordinates of u, say u1 and u2. And what that represented is the rate of increase of the function of f as you move in the direction of the vector u. We can make this look like a directional derivative. Just consider the following. In this case, my function is u, so I'll use the vector v, where v I'm going to assume is the vector 1c. And I'm not going to assume that v is a unit vector. In this case, you can see that the gradient of u dotted with the vector v, the gradient in this case will be the derivative of u with respect to t, the derivative of u with respect to x, and I'm dotting with the vector 1c. That gives me du dt plus c times du dx. 
And if that's equal to zero, what that tells us is that the function u is constant as you're moving in the direction of this vector. Any rescaling of this vector will do. We could normalize it if we want, but we don't even have to. All I have to do is know that if I go up one on the time unit and over c on the spatial unit, x, I'll end up with a straight line. If I start here and go up one on the time unit and over c on the x, all on that straight line, the solution will be constant. In other words, if u is in the form x minus c t, you can see that whenever uh, x minus c t is a constant, i.e. on a line with that constant being, say, the intercept, then this function will be a, that particular value, that u of that constant value. In other words, if u has some distribution initially, then that distribution must be translated to the right as time goes on. We're translating to the right by ct units as t increases. And so as time goes on, that waveform of the function u will be translated to the right. In other words, solutions of this equation are waves that translate at constant speed in one direction, to the right. If we change the plus to a minus, the waves would go to the left. To get into the nitty-gritty details of functions of this form, notice that if we set xi equal to x minus ct, then the derivative of u with respect to t will be du d xi d xi dt. And that's going to be minus c times, we'll denote du d xi by just u prime. Also, du dx will be du d xi times the partial derivative of xi with respect to x, which is 1 times u prime. If we plug these into the differential equation, ut plus cux, we'll have negative cu prime plus cu prime, which is clearly zero, and therefore any wave traveling at a constant speed of c to the right will give you a solution to this differential equation. We should be a little more careful and point something in addition out. Let's suppose that at time t equals zero, we define this function to be some function u naught of x. This gives us an initial value problem. Note that the solution u is supposed to be some function in this form, x minus ct, but u naught of x has to be you evaluate it at zero, and hence u of x. That tells us what u of x is. u of x has to be consistent with the waveform initially at time t equals zero. So the solution to the initial value problem is the initial function u naught, but translated to the right as time goes by. We could generalize this so that the wave speed changes, not only with time, but also position as well. But that's a little complicated for us right now. A classic partial differential equation is the continuity equation that represents conservation of mass. Let's derive the continuity equation so that you can see exactly where it comes from. Suppose that we have some 
blob-shaped region R, and fluid can go in and out of this region freely. Suppose it has some velocity and also some density. The density, typically denoted by rho, this symbol, there's the lowercase rho, there's the uppercase rho, R H O. It um, they have units of say kilograms per cubic meter. Now, the total amount of mass within the region R can be calculated very simply by adding up the density times the volume element. Notice that the units of the density times the volume element are kilograms per cubic meter times cubic meters. In other words, kilograms. Rho dV is an element of mass. If you add the element of mass over the entire region R, you get the total mass. But the mass doesn't necessarily stay the same because fluid can easily cross the boundary and either enter or leave. So the flux is the rate at which mass leaves. In other words, it's minus the time derivative of the total mass, which will be minus the derivative, the integral on R of the partial derivative of rho dt by moving the ordinary derivative into the integral. It now acts on a function that involves more than just t, but t, x, y, and z, so it becomes a partial derivative once it goes inside. But you know, having taken vector calculus, that the flux can also be added up on the boundary using an, a unit exterior normal field. The flux is also the surface integral around the boundary of the region R of the vector field, which will be rho v dot n times a surface element. Let's see if this has the correct units. Density is, of course, kilograms per cubic meter. Velocity is meters per second. The unit exterior normal has no units because it's been normalized to have length one. But the surface element, a little patch of surface, will have units of square meters. So we get kilograms per second. That's the rate at which mass is being pumped across the boundary. So here we have two representations for the flux. And we're assuming that these are equal because we're assuming that the only way mass can change within the region is by flux across the boundary. We are implicitly implying that mass is not created or destroyed within the region. It can only change by flowing across the boundary. At this point, I'm going to convert this surface integral into a volume integral using the divergence theorem. What we'll get is the integral on R of the divergence of the vector field rho v integrated up against a volume element now. That equals this other volume integral. We can combine these two triple integrals into a single triple integral by moving this one on the right over to the left. We'll have the partial derivative of rho with respect to t plus the divergence of rho v all times dv. Now, the region R was not special in any way. It was completely arbitrary, which means that if this integrand is continuous, hence the continuity equation, and if there is some point in the domain where the function is positive, this will represent something that has more than one variable, so it ends up being kind of a hypersurface, if you will. If there's some place where it's positive, you can make that region R so small that the function will be positive 
on nearby points as well. If the function is continuous, it'll take time for it to get down to values of zero. So you can make r small enough that it would capture a positive value, not zero. But that's not possible. You're supposed to get zero for any region r, which means there can't be any places in the domain of this function, if it is continuous, where it has a positive value. Similarly, it can't take negative values either. By the vanishing inter integrals principle, whereby if you have an integrand that is continuous and it, the integral vanishes over all regions r, then the integrand itself must in fact be zero. And this is the famous continuity equation in fluid dynamics. It results from conservation of mass. The only way that mass can change within that region is flux across the boundaries. And so these are your fluxes and these are your conserved quantities. Notice that the continuity equation is a single constraint on four functions. The velocity vector v has an x-coordinate, y-coordinate, and z-coordinate. There are three coordinate functions. And rho is another scalar valued function. So there are four scalar valued functions and their derivatives involved in one equation, which kind of should make you think there needs to be more equations, more partial differential equations to govern the motion of this fluid. In fact, you'll find that conservation of momentum adds three more equations, but introduces another function, the pressure which gives you five functions and four equations. Yet one more equation, conservation of energy, gives you five equations and five unknown functions. And then you have a complete system of partial differential equations that you can solve. It implies that the dynamics of a fluid is completely determined by conservation of mass, energy, and momentum. To proceed, there are a couple technical things I'd like to discuss. We won't get too far into the weeds, but I wanted to talk about the Helmholtz theorem. I won't give you all of the technical details, just the spirit of the theorem. If you have some vector field, that vector field can be decomposed into two parts. The first part is the gradient of a scalar potential, which I'll call phi, and then the curl of a vector potential, which I'll call capital phi. Remember, the curl of a gradient is always the zero vector. In other words, any gradient field, gradient fields are conservative vector fields you might remember, are irrotational. So this has none of the curl and all of the divergence. The divergence of a curl is zero, which means the second term has none of the divergence and all of the curl. So the first part has all of the divergence none of the curl. The second part has all of the curl, none of the divergence. And the beautiful thing about the Helmholtz theorem is there are only these two parts. One part is all divergence, no curl. The other part is all curl, no divergence. And there is no third part. Every vector field can be decomposed into these two pieces. The same is true for the electric field and the magnetic field described by Maxwell's laws.
One of Maxwell's laws is that the divergence of the electric field is some constant times the charge density. This describes the divergence of the electric field. But according to the Helmholtz theorem, there's two parts. So there must be a second part describing the curl. And in fact, the curl is minus the partial derivative of the magnetic field with respect to time. You can imagine a loop of wire with a magnet, a bar magnet either on the side or going through the middle or whatever. The motion of that magnetic field will induce a curl or a current in the wire. These two equations describe the divergence and the curl of the electric field. You would think that would be all there is to E, except it's kind of mixed in with the magnetic field as well. So we need equations governing the magnetic field. The first of which is the divergence of the magnetic field is zero. It's all curl, no divergence. And then lastly, you would expect that you have to describe the divergence and the curl in order to completely describe the vector field. It's going to be some constant u naught times epsilon naught times the partial derivative of the electric field with respect to time plus a current vector. This should give you a complete description of the electric and magnetic fields. It has sources. One source is a charge density. Another source is the current. So an electric current can be a source inducing, say, magnetic curling magnetic field or a um, diverging electric field. Let's look at these in the case of a source-free electromagnetic field. A source-free electromagnetic field has the density, the charge density identically zero, and the current identically zero. So what is there to talk about? Well, we'll find out. But first, we need to look at a particular computation. I want to discuss a little calculation first, a little lemma. A lemma is a theorem that is used to prove other theorems. And in particular, the curl of the curl of a vector field is equal to the gradient of the divergence of the vector field minus the divergence of the gradient of the vector field. By the way, the divergence of the gradient of a vector field is the Laplacian. Divergence of gradient is the Laplacian. It's also sometimes denoted by del squared or nabla squared. Note that the Laplacian of a function is the divergence of the gradient of that function. The gradient is the partial derivatives. Let's just do this in two dimensions, easily generalizable to arbitrary dimensions. And then the divergence takes the vectors d dx, d dy, which is what del represents, and dots that with these partial derivatives. And that gives you d squared u dx squared plus d squared u dy squared, with obvious additional terms in higher dimensions. Let's suppose, let's not do all of the proof, but I'll get you started. Suppose that v has the coordinates m, n, p where all of these are functions of x, y, and z. Then the curl of V 
is calculated in the usual way. I'll denote the partial derivatives by dx, dy, and dz. MNP. And that gives us the partial derivative of p with respect to y minus the partial derivative of n with respect to z. We always take on the i component, we cross out its column and row, take the determinant of its minor. On the middle one, cross out the row and column, take the determinant of what's left over. You have to change the sign on the middle cofactor. So you'll get minus the quantity px minus mz. And then finally, nx minus my where the subscripts represent partial derivatives with respect to those variables. Now, we need to take the curl of this. So we're going to take the curl of the curl of V. I have to space these a little further apart. We're going to have PY minus NZ. I'll have, let's see, how about mz minus px and then nx minus my. And so we have the vector field nxy minus myy, and then we subtract m zz minus minus is going to be plus p xz. Before we're moving on to the next coordinate, I want to think about what I have here for a moment. Notice that what I have is almost a Laplacian of m. I'm missing a minus mxx. So if I add mxx and subtract mxx, I'll have minus the Laplacian of m. And what's left over will have all terms with a derivative involving x. So what I'll have is the derivative with respect to x of what looks like the divergence of my vector field minus the Laplacian of M. I think you might be able to see that the remaining terms will be the derivative with respect to Y of the divergence of V minus the Laplacian of N. And then the derivative with respect to z of the divergence of v minus the Laplacian of p. If you take that all together, I think you can see that the remaining terms will end up giving you the gradient of the divergence of v. Here we have derivative with respect to x, derivative with respect to y, derivative with respect to z, minus the Laplacian of V. It's kind of interesting to think about this as a commutator of sorts, a gradient and a divergence applied to V, where by a commutator I mean apply the two operations one way and then subtract applying them in the other order. Now, I said we were going to apply this to Maxwell's laws. So let's look at the curl of the curl of the electric field. Well, according to the formula that we just proved, that's the gradient of the divergence of the electric field minus the divergence of the gradient of the electric field, but it is also because of the fact that the curl is equal to the minus the time derivative 
of the magnetic field, it's also minus the time derivative of the curl of the magnetic field. Now, according to our assumptions, we're assuming a source-free electromagnetic field, which means that the divergence of E, which is normally rho, will in fact be zero. We're assuming that the charge density is identically zero. So we end up with the divergence of the gradient of E, that's minus the Laplacian of E. On the other side, we have minus the time derivative of. Now the curl of B is going to be mu naught, epsilon naught, times the derivative of the electric field with respect to time. Normally we'd have plus mu times j, but j is zero. And so what we get here is minus mu naught epsilon naught times the second order derivative of E with respect to T. Notice that we can get rid of the minus signs also. Mu naught epsilon naught is often denoted by 1 over C squared. And so what we're getting here is 1 over C squared times the second order derivative of E with respect to time is the Laplacian of E. This is called a wave equation. As you will see shortly, solutions to the wave equation represent waves moving at a constant speed, c. In this case, the speed c is the speed of light. So you have electrical waves moving at the speed of light. That will solve this wave equation. But what about the magnetic field? You can approach the magnetic field in exactly the same way and end up with exactly the same equation. So both the electric and magnetic fields in a source-free electromagnetic field will satisfy a wave equation. They'll both move in some wave pattern at the speed of light. I want to look at the wave equation more generally. It will be very important for the rest of this course, in addition to some other equations that we'll talk about. 1 over c squared d squared u dt squared equals the Laplacian of u. In a one-dimensional problem, that's going to be 1 over c squared d squared uh, u dt squared equals d squared u dx squared, where here we're assuming that u is a function of x and t alone. There is something called the d'Alembert solution. The d'Alembert solution has u equal to some function, a waveform, moving at a constant speed to the right, and another waveform moving at constant speed to the left. We're adding these two together, giving you a kind of superposition of these two waves as they pass through each other. In this case, you can see that ut is going to be the derivative of f times the derivative of the inside with respect to t but the derivative of the inside with respect to t is minus c. And then you'll get the derivative of g times the derivative of the inside, which is c. Taking the derivative again, you end up with a c squared here, times f double prime plus g double prime. Alternatively, the derivative with respect to x is going to be f prime 
times the derivative of the inside with respect to x, which is 1. And the same thing for g. So that u x x is just f double prime plus g double prime. It follows then that 1 over c squared times u t t is u x x. And anything of this form will in fact solve this one dimensional wave equation. The thing that we have to recognize is, is that at time t equals zero, what we get is f of x plus g of x. Now, another way to view this, let's let tau be c times t. Notice that if the units of c are meters per second, and if the unit, units of t are seconds, tau will have units of meters, units of length. And also, 1 over c squared, d squared u, dt squared is the same thing as d squared u, d of ct squared, and that is d squared u, d tau squared. So another way of viewing the wave equation is u tau tau equals u x x in this case. But we're going to make another change to this. We're going to convert this second order equation, a single second order equation, to a system of first order equations. So what we're going to do is let w be u tau and y be u x. If that's the case, those imply that the original wave equation is w tau equals y x. In other words, w tau minus y x equals zero. We can combine these two defining equations for the new variables by taking partial derivatives. The partial derivative of y with respect to tau will be the same as the partial derivative of w with respect to x. And so the original equation is now equivalent to this first order system. Let's look at this in a little more detail. We can think of this system as yw tau plus 0 minus 1 minus 1 0 times yw x equals 0, 0. You can see that if we multiply here, we'll get a wx together with our yt tau, and also a yx together with our w tau. Now, if we convert this back so that we have a c and time t, we'll get equivalently ywt plus 0, negative c, negative c, 0, times y, w, x, equals 0, 0. If we set u to be y, w, then this, which represents the wave equation, remember, can be thought of as u, t, plus, I'll call this matrix j, times ux is equal to the zero vector, where j is this matrix. Now I want to know where u is constant. It may be constant on some curves, which might be parameterized as t x of t, in which case zero will be the derivative of this, x of t, and by the chain rule, that's going to be du dt times dt dt, which is 1, plus du dx times 
dx dt, which is the speed of the curve where this function is constant. Now, according to our differential equation, 0 will be ut, but ut is minus j ux plus ux times the scalar valued function dx dt. If we factor out ux, the only way to do that is to insert an identity matrix here because this is a matrix and this is a scalar. And you can't take a matrix and add it to a scalar. So we have to factor it as follows. i times dx dt minus j times ux. And what this equation tells us is that ux is an eigenvector of the matrix j, and dx dt, the speed of the curve, is an eigenvalue of the matrix J. Now, since the matrix J has all constant entries, that implies immediately that the speed of the curve on which this function is constant will be a constant. It's not going to be some weird function. It's going to be a constant. Also, we need to find those eigenvalues. So let's look at our matrix J. And let's find the eigenvalues. Remember, the eigenvalues are the wave speeds. To find the eigenvalues, you subtract lambda from the diagonal elements and take the determinant. We'll set that equal to zero. This gives us a positive lambda squared and then a minus. Minus minus is positive, but we have to subtract from that direction, so it's going to be minus c squared, which gives us lambda is plus or minus c. The wave speeds are plus or minus c, which is exactly what we've been saying to this point. So this function solution u is going to be constant on waves that move at constant speed to the right or constant speed to the left, that speed being c. So far we've been looking at waves that can travel infinitely to the right or infinitely to the left. We've put no constraints on the domain for the x values. But what if we're dealing with a string that is tied at both ends? It can have various waveforms, but it can't deviate from zero at the endpoints. In this case, the wave equation may take a slightly different form. We need to have the wave equation hold, but we need to have u at, for all time, at zero is zero. We think of u as being the displacement from equilibrium. And let's suppose that these are L units apart. We need to have u at all times evaluated at L being zero. So there's no displacement at either endpoints. Initially, it's okay to have at time t equals zero some waveform, but even there we must require that at x equals zero we get zero, and at x equals l we have zero. So we can have some weird waveform here, some function almost arbitrary, except we can't deviate from zero at the endpoints. So in this case, we have not only initial data that the differential equation has to satisfy, the partial differential equation, but we also have what are called boundary conditions. So we have an initial boundary value problem. In the case that we're only working on an interval for x values between zero and l, what does our solution process look like now? Now we're going to make an assumption that may seem outlandish at first, but we are going to justify this assumption as we go through this subject. We're going to assume that the solution has the form 
some constant a times the sine of, let's say, uh, a times x times the cosine of b times t. What does it take in order for a function of this form to satisfy our initial boundary conditions? At least, let's look at the boundary conditions. We need 0 to be u for all time at 0. That's just true in this case, by design, because I chose the sine function. So that one does hold by construction. But I also have to have u for all time at L b0. Well, for that to hold, I have to have 0 for all time be a times the sine of a times L cosine of b t. If this has to be true for all time t, then this had better not even matter. This had better be 0. The sine of al must be 0. But where does the sine function take on the value of 0? Sine is only 0 at integer multiples of pi. A times L must in fact be n times pi, where n is an element of the set of integers. Zahlen in German. If you ever wondered why it's denoted by a blackboard bold Z, it's because of the German word. Zalen. And so that tells us what this constant a must be. a can't be anything. a has to be n pi divided by the length of the interval where n takes on a value within the set of integers. What is more, if we use negative integers, like negative 2, the negative can come out of the sine function and be incorporated into this constant a, this a being some arbitrary constant, which means maybe we don't need all of these integers. Maybe we only need the positive or zero integers. Notice that if we set n uh, zero to be a set of all natural numbers, including the number zero, the natural numbers starting at one and going up, like that, then maybe we only need to choose values of little n that come from blackboard bold n sub zero, or we can sometimes call that n naught. Not like n-a-u-g-h-t, it's all for naught. So this n will take from n naught. We pretty much know what this constant a needs to be looked like, but what about b? Well, we haven't said anything about how this solves the differential equation. If we take the derivative with respect to time twice, the derivative of cosine twice is negative cosine. But you have to take the derivative of the inside twice. So you'll get negative 1 over c squared b squared times the original function u, the second derivative, returning it back to just a constant multiple of what of what of what it really originally was. Now how about uxx? Well that's going to be negative again. Um, we'll get two factors of a and then back to what it was. Now these have to be equal in order to be a solution to the differential equation which tells us that b squared over c squared must in fact equal a squared. So b will depend upon the value that we have for a. b will be plus or minus c a, but does the plus or minus really matter if you're inside of a cosine function? Remember that cosine is even. So if you use a negative, you'll get the same thing as if you use a positive. 
let's just assume that we're dealing with positives again. So if B is a constant C, the wave speed C times A, then B is going to be C n pi over L, where n lies in the set of whole numbers. And so what we're getting so far is that u is going to look like some constant times the sine of n pi over L times x times the cosine of c n pi over L times t. But there's an important trigonometric identity that you may or may not remember, and we need to apply it right here. It's called a product to sum identity. How well do you remember those product to sum identities? Let's derive the one that we need that involves sine and cosine. Remember that the sine of a minus b is the sine of a cosine of b minus the sine of b cosine of a. Also, the sine of a plus b is the sine of a cosine of b plus the sine of b cosine of a. Now if we add these two, the sine of a minus b and the sine of a plus b, we'll get twice the sine of a cosine of b. All we need to do is divide this two off. And so what we'll get is a divided by two times the sine of the difference of these two. These two have a common factor of n pi over L. We'll have x minus ct plus the sine of the sum of those two. Again, factoring out n pi over L, we'll have x plus ct. And so you can see we end up with a sinusoidal wave moving to the right and another sinusoidal wave moving to the left. We can now put a little subscript on this constant, and for different values of n, we will have different solutions to the differential equation, the partial differential equation. If we have different solutions, say u1 and u2, it's pretty easy to see that an arbitrary linear combination of these two solutions will also solve this differential equation. If you have k1 u1 plus k2 u2, k1 u1 plus k2 u2, you can break this up to the differential equation applied to u1, and then the differential equation applied to u2. You get k1 times 0 plus k2 times 0, which is 0. So any linear combination of solutions to the linear system here of partial differential equations, this linear partial differential equation, will in fact give you a solution, which means we have a bunch of solutions here. We can add them together with these as the coefficients in the linear combination. We can actually absorb the two into those as well. What if we set u to be the sum 
as n goes from, well, n equals zero won't be of any interest to us. From one to infinity of a sub n sine of n pi over l x cosine c n pi over l t. The only question is, is it still a solution in the limit as we go to infinity here? We know for finite sums, this will be in fact yield a solution. But what about on in the infinite limit? This is a question we need to think about in a little more detail. Such a kind of solution involves sums of factors involving sine and cosine. This is a type of Fourier series. Or a Fourier series. We should ask the question, for which combinations of sines and cosines can we construct the initial data when t is equal to zero? Which of these sinusoidal waves can you add up to yield any given function? Can you get any function or only certain kinds of functions? We'll have to take a deep dive looking at Fourier series in order to answer these questions. But right now, we'll tentatively say, hmm, maybe we can, maybe we can't. We're going to have to look at this in a lot more detail. For now, I'd like to look at what happens, say, when n equals 1, n equals 2, uh, n equals 3, or combinations of these. What do the graphs of these solutions look like? It's supposed to be a string that's vibrating with little waves traveling to each end. We'll see what happens. Let's look at this using a computer algebra system. I'm going to use Maple. You can use Mathematica or any other version of a computer algebra system that you wish. But I'll show you how to do some of this. Okay, we're going to start with plots. And then let's start with n defined to be 1, u defined to be x comma t goes to, let's say, the sine of n times pi times x times the cosine of, if we choose c equals 1 and l equals 1, n times pi times t. There's our function. I want to animate this. With x is the first coordinate, u of x comma t is the second coordinate, x is going to go from um, 0 to 1, because that was our interval. t is going to go from 0 to, let's say, 8 times pi. Oops. And the um, number of frames will be, let's say, 50. Num points equals 1,000, and view frame is going to go as x goes from 0 to 1, and u goes from minus 1 to 1. And uh, there's one more thing. I'll make the color black. And if we put this in here, we have our animation. And so you can see this thing is like a string, a rubber band, that is vibrating up and down. And that's all that it's doing. It's going up and down and up and down. But that's with n equals 1. If n equals 2, we get a different vibrational mode. What does that vibrational mode look like now? Well, that's a little too fast. Let's do the following. Let's change this to 2 pi. 
and we'll loop this. Now you can see that it looks like a string that's still vibrating, but it's wobbling as when the left side is down, the right side is up, and vice versa. Okay, that was with n equals 2. A different vibrational mode. What about n equals 3? If n equals 3, you can see, again, clearly, yet another vibrational mode. But we can add these different solutions together. What if I have something that looks like this? I'm going to take my function and change it. Where here I'm going to use n equals 1. In the next term I'm going to use n equals 2. And the term after that, n equals 3. And I'm also going to divide this term by 2. I'm going to change the coefficient. And this term I'm going to divide by 3. So I'm going to add smaller components. I'm going to need to zoom out a little bit. But I can combine these different vibrational modes and get a different kind of vibrating string. Hopefully this looks somewhat realistic to you, more or less, other than a little hiccup where it uh, changes it e equals 2 pi. So we can get this thing to vibrate by combining these different vibrational modes and we can make those vibrations fairly complicated. What kind of waveforms can we get? Let's stop the animation real quick. Let's stop it um, right where it began, how it looks. This is the initial wave profile. What initial wave profiles can we make by combining, in a, as though uh, we're forming a linear combination, these different sinusoidal waves? We know they're sinusoidal because they look like sine of n pi over l times x minus ct, or x plus ct, as the case may be. What kind of weird function patterns can we approximate or get exactly by combining sinusoidal waves like these up here? We're going to answer those questions as we go along. We will have to constrain ourselves to more of a descriptive theory than proving every single theorem as we go along the way. It would require a more advanced course in analysis in order to analyze what functions can and cannot be represented by a Fourier series. We'll describe the, what functions you may do that for, but we'll leave it for a more advanced course to prove the various theorems that we'll use.